and those are not attached to a salt. Those are pure right. BHB. So, and in the future, will there be a way to produce those without salts? I mean, yes. I mean, we're still in essentially diapers um, in, in the applications and ways we could use this, but the acids are a huge break breakthrough because that's what you see in things like Rev7, which is a, a energy yeah. drink without caffeine. And you see it in reactive energy, reaction energy drink is another one that uses it. And you're going to see a lot of energy drinks start using that. It's easy to flavor it, as long as it, it wouldn't taste good in chocolate because you know, it's acid, but it's going to taste yeah, good tart. in any kind of yeah. lemon. Yeah. It's very tart. It's very tart, but the salts are decently the way I see this. And, and then I'll, we'll kind of go to, go to, you know, application if you have a couple minutes. So the way I see BHB is where creatine is where people are going to buy just tubs of BHB tubs of it, just plain because it's pretty flavorless in a powder form. You can mix it in a protein shake. You can throw in an orange juice, you can do whatever you want with it. And I also see it being used in applications. I see it going down a similar route to creatine, but with number one, there's less negative attributes because the media was really unfair to creatine at the beginning. They said it was a yep. steroid. And, um, and, I, and I do think that that's the path that's going to go where it's just going to be sold by the bulk powder and then put in applications. And I, I, think, I think that's where we're at right now. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. And you, you certainly have your finger on the pulse of that market better than I do. But it's, it's easy to see just as a scientist – how the interest in this is not going to go away anytime soon because the amount of evidence coming out to support it all the more so in the kind of modern movement to promote a greater awareness of health and nutrition than we've ever seen before in which, which thrills me. I think interest in ketones is not going to go down, but to, to, to your question, I have a lot of thoughts about TRT where I think that I respect the power of testosterone in men. And yet I think in most men who will have lower or less than optimal, let's say, which is a squishy way of saying it, but yeah. less than optimal levels of testosterone. I actually don't think it's a fundamental deficit of his gonads. I think it's an, he has too much fat. And when fat mm. tissue is too big, yes. when fat cells are too big, they actually start acting like ovaries in the man, which is to say they will literally pull in testosterone that the testes worked hard to make and then release it as estrogen. That is literally something happen, yes. in, happening in men. And so I think very often we have the conversation backwards where you'll hear the radio ad, hey, guy, are you overweight? It's because you're low T. Actually, if anything, in the average guy, you're low T because you're overweight. And so if a person adopts a strategy, including the perhaps if smart use of exogenous ketones to promote fat burning, which again, my lab has shown in humans in ketosis, metabolic rate in fat cells went up by three times. Their fat rate in their, their, their fat tissue metabolic rate was three times higher when they were in ketosis. So if you can promote the overall metabolic milieu where you're burning more fat, you're shrinking your fat cells, now you're allowing the testosterone that your testes have already made to just stay as testosterone and get all the benefits of that testosterone, then I think you're, being, you're, you're addressing it at a more root cause. Not to say a guy can't benefit. I, I don't even mean for that to be very negative on TRT. I think it can be very beneficial. There are also other treatments like in clomiphene that can just stimulate a guy making more of his own testosterone by mimicking the, the brain signal that goes to the testes in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think there can be some smart use of these interventions, but I also think it's helpful to, to not mix up the order of events. So testosterone is a funny thing in that the testosterone levels of a 20 year old guy is equal to something like a seven year old guy in the sixties or seventies. Yeah. I saw that stat, but if you ever looked, I actually did this. I had chat GPT do a graph. I don't, and, and then it erased before I posted it, but you, you know how it does that. You turn off your computer and it's like, why'd you reset everything? Yeah. And it forgets it. Yeah. I did a, I did a line of the obesity rate and the testosterone. And there's a direct, I mean, the most direct correlation you will ever see in your life as obesity rates went up, male testosterone went down. Obviously there's other factors you're going to see in the comments, microplastics and, you know, Alex Jones, you know, he said that uh, the frogs yeah, are turning they're, gay. They're turning the frog. Yeah. They're yeah. turning the frogs gay. And maybe he wasn't maybe. wrong. <laughs> no, no. The frog. Oh my God. He was right about that. That was crazy. Was. And then. Then you see an article, I, someone posted the article. It's like Alex Jones was, and it's like frogs that are turning gay or something yeah. like, oh, wait, I, I think I heard that before. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's wild, but yeah, there is a direct correlation. I've gotten in many debates and arguments, it's good to hear you share this position, that the number one cause of testosterone decline in our society, and there could be other factors compounding yep. it or doing it on the individually, is obesity. And obesity is something that, but say what you about GLP-1s, I know it's a Band-Aid, it's not changing lifestyle, but even if they have some side effects, obesity going down, I see yeah. that as a positive. Yeah, so no, no. In fact, Mark, my views on GLP-1 drugs, and I say this as a guy, I have been familiar with these drugs for 20 years from my PhD days. Yeah. Um, my, my PhD lab was one of the first funded labs from Johnson & Johnson to study these incretins, these gut-derived hormones. My view, maybe I'll just mention, if anyone wants to see, I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Times um, about the the use of GLP-1 drugs where I think they are so powerful that they don't need to be used at the high doses they're currently yes, being used. Yes, yes. But, but they also shouldn't be used. We shouldn't say this is a weight loss drug. What we should say is this is a habit changing drug. And, and it's going to help you learn how to eat differently. It's going to help you learn to control your cravings. And so the, the, the view that I take with these drugs is we should use them at much lower levels and we should so microdose and do the and do it in cycles. And the cycle is based on a person being able to change their cravings for carbohydrates because that is the thing we crave. No one is sitting around on a Friday night wanting to just pound a plate of bacon and eggs. It doesn't happen. <laughs> no, we want no. carbs. And that's what people have a hard time controlling. That's what humans appear to be have some addiction. Not all carbs, of course. No one's craving broccoli, after all, or even an apple. They want something salty and crunchy or sweet and gooey. So my view on the GLP-1 weight loss drugs is don't look at them, anyone listening, as a weight loss tool per se uh, that's going to somehow undo any of your bad choices. Look at, as, look at it as something that's helping you overcome your habits and addictions that are bad. And it's helping you learn to make better choices because then that gives you the freedom of cycling off the drug at some future time to see whether the habits have become permanent. Yeah, and I hate to add this, but there is some evidence to BHB increasing GLP-1. I was reading that data this morning. I don't know if you've seen that data. It's pretty, pretty interesting. No, but it wouldn't surprise me. Anything yeah. that gets absorbed in the guts in a quirky way will have an effect on GLP-1. And, and drinking BHB is a very quirky thing to do. Not that it's wrong, um, but it's it's uncommon. Yeah, I agree. So, so just kind of summarize everything. We talked about all the benefits, and there's so many different delivery methods. There's this product called Let's Go, which is a sachet of gel. It delivers four grams. You got the powders. You have all these different ways to take BHB. If you're looking at deriving the benefits, what would be – Based on current data, again, this is malleable. Like we found out now creatine, if you're sleep deprived, you take creatine before that, you pretty much wipe out all the issues with, you know, sleep deprivation symptoms. So we keep, we're, science is malleable. Science changes. It changes. We learn yeah. new things. Yeah, Based but Mark, the, just, just yeah. to go on that for just a second, yeah. as a scientist, it has been such a point of frustration for me over the past five to six years to see people say, believe the science. That is the most unscientific thing you can say as a scientist. <laughs> it, it is it is a rejection. Science is the relentless pursuit of truth. Or to say that another way, the pursuit of trying to prove yourself wrong. Like you are constantly asking yourself a question and then trying to prove that question wrong. Mm -hmm. And so if you now say, trust the science, no, no. Be skeptical of the science. Try to prove it wrong, which is a, which is what allows advancement. It's what allows this objective, impartial approach to just trying to understand the world. Once we think the science is settled, we've become nothing more than a religious fanatic. Now, I'm a very religious guy, but yeah, I appreciate thanks. I appreciate the difference between a declaration of faith, which I make very readily in, in God, in my religion, but at the same time being very skeptical and cynical of trying to understand truth within this physical mortal realm, which is what a scientist does. Anyway, now, I hijacked I, I, that question. No, Mark, no, so. I, I got in a lot of trouble in between 2020 and 2022 for not trusting the science. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I yeah, was yeah. called a we're, lot we're of touching names. on a broader topic here. You, you could Google my name and you got, you got hate articles about me. Um, just people say, cause you know, I, I have a platform and yeah. I spoke up with my opinion, which by the way was right. And, um, <laughs> but I'm yeah, not gonna... you had your own version of Alex Jones and the frogs. You were right, Mark. 
Uh, yeah, but but his was better. Like yeah, more inflammatory. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it should have been inflammatory. I'm not. Look, I'm not nearly the scientist you are. I don't have a PhD. But uh, but we're both seekers of truth. I love science. It's it's what I live for every day. So looking at the dosing of BHP, if you're looking at different scenarios, let's say general population, what total grams should you get per day to get most of the perceived benefits or the inherent benefits? If you're an athlete, how would you dose it around an event? Can we give a couple scenarios? Cause I have my nephews in town and he's uh he's, he's actually going into the major league baseball draft right now. He's a junior in college, great baseball player. How would you apply it to different populations? Dosing yeah. Benefits? So, so I got to that, I love the question. And in fact, I almost want to bounce it back to you after I stumble through this. I suspect you actually probably have a better answer to it than me, but I appreciate you letting me take a kind of first swing at it. So let me see if I don't, I'll, I'll try to get a single and you get, you hit the home run to, to, to now invoke Rob's or just any baseball analogy here. So uh, from what I understand, the, the standard dosing is going to be in just the realm of a, of a couple grams, but with athletic performance or the higher the demand, the higher the ability to use those ketones in, as a fuel. But there are uh, studies in humans to show people going up to 10 grams of the ketone of the BHB electrolytes. And so there's clearly a very broad range here um, where, you know, 10 grams is a pretty nice load. And yet that's been very well documented in the human literature. So I'd say for me personally, I'm, minimum 10 grams um, a, a day, to be frank. And, and I use, for me as a middle-aged guy who wants to be a very healthy, involved dad and a very healthy, involved grandpa, where I want my body to perform and I want my brain to be sharp, I take a, a probably three to five grams right when I wake up. I probably take about that same amount when I go work out and probably that same amount before I go to bed frankly, but it's a mix of electrolyte, the D form and the L form. Yeah. The D and L is going to be a whole nut. So basically look, D is bioidentical. The L form, we didn't know what it did for a long time. Now it's shown to be kind of like, that's what you're going to find in energy drinks. I in fact, it's like, funny you say that yeah. I actually <laughs> experimented and it would be a few really? nights in a row where I thought, why the hell am I not sleeping? Mean, I'm a bad sleeper anyway. Really? And I thought, this is like next level bad. I'm just so, um, but I didn't feel buzzed. I just was awake. And and I think it's because I was taking L before bed, to be honest. <laughs> I was just so, awake. Yeah. So if you're looking at an energy drink, like Rev7 is going to be the L. If you're looking at, but what I like for pre-training is a DL blend. So it also, there's a 50-50 blend of DL. There's different brands that do different ratios. So that's, that's a conversation that I can explain some other day, the difference between DNL. That's a, uh, it, it honestly, they're, they're both awesome, but you know, you're going to find L in a lot of the energy drink applications. The D isomer was what you, what was used in the sleep study. So just going on that for me, I like, I think the sweet spot, the structure function claims are based on studies using 10 to 10 grams. So 10 grams is that sweet spot. Um, if I'm doing a pre-workout, I'm doing 10 grams of the D and the L. As, or you go down to five. There's new studies going on right now um, with Dr. Jose Antonio. You know him out of Florida. Um, he's doing it with two grams and five grams of both the D and the L. Those are cognition studies. I like to see about anywhere between four and 10 grams pre-workout. And during the day for all the crazy benefits, just looking at my interpretation of the data, which will probably vary from other people's data is interpreted, right? And I'm looking at 10 to 20 grams. I don't think you need to go over 20 grams. There's nothing bad that'll happen other than if you're consuming a lot of salts, you get a lot of magnesium and you end up having to poop, but that's really it. So, but again, like it comes in different ice where you can mix up the minerals as you want. Yep. So yeah, I would, I would honestly say 10 to 20 grams, but for an acute effect and a lot of health benefits, I, you go as low as two. And again, there's more data being, you know, um, published in the next year and you go as high as, um, anywhere from two to four is the lower end. And then you go into the 10 to 20. That's when, yeah. that's when you, you know, your bases are covered. If you get 10, you're probably good. You're going to get probably 90 to 99% of the benefits. And honestly, with my activity, the way my brain has to work every day, lack of sleep, you know, I'm going to take the higher end. And like you said, it, it's based on the athlete's need. So if you're, if you're a professional athlete and you're doing triple day, tr three time a day training, 
yeah, I think the higher end would be great, 